fascinating reading. Although, as I was just saying to our wizard here, there were bits that I wanted to know more about. Lots of bits that I wanted to know more about. For example, the time in the Middle East. Well, I thought travel books are so boring. Now, it was very exciting those days. In the 1950s, mm -hmm. people weren't out there much, except a few Kiwis and Aussies, and that's all you saw. Um, it was it's because the roads weren't, weren't made up. You couldn't get transport. There was economic, economic crises. Certain countries closed down because of wars. But we did, uh, Smonica and I, make this journey. And I ended up in Iran, which I liked very much under the Shah. Very tolerant, Jews, Christians, Muslims, all mixing together well. Our economy was leaping ahead. And then, of course, in came the loony with the help of the CIA and all the left-wing trendies. And in came this crazy mullah and wrecked the place. Well, that was after we left. But it was a strange period living in uh, Iran, which isn't Arab, but it is Muslim. Uh, and uh, making journeys across Europe and up to the Arctic Circle regularly. So there's a lot of travelling involved in those days. Before I went to university, I was a great traveller. Mm -hmm. Now, but at that stage, your wizard hat was undiscovered as yet. Well, I was exploring the world first. I thought, well, I'm very biased towards my own background, my own religion, my own people. I must have a look around and see if I'm being one-eyed about it all. So I had a good look around and decided everyone else was worse than I was. So I came back to the original. Well, it's even worse than being English and being C of E and being a Boy Scout. Right? This is even worse. Went to America too, as you see earlier on, and hitchhiked by air, as in, I was in the RAF, so I could air, I went all over the States too, and thought, not bad, but not as good as being British and living in England. And then you moved to Australia. Well, I found that most of my friends in London and where I was travelling around were, were Australians or New Zealanders. I thought, <laughs> I had that sort of breezy, don't give, a, don't give a heck, you know, be rude to the boss, you feel like it, this sort of, which I like very much. I'm not into the crawling to the boss routine much. And she'll be right, it was a good philosophy from someone like me. The problem's a bit too cautious, I think, so I thought perhaps I ought to go out there. And then this job came out. The, the Western government advertised for someone to organise culture for the University of WA, and they couldn't find anybody that had done this at a university level. Except me, I did it as a, because I was so bored with the student life, which was socials and booze-ups and dances and sport. And I thought, we need some culture out here. So we all stood for election to the student union, and I became the cultural affairs officer first in Britain and organised cultural things that hadn't been there before, and all, got money for those that were there, and this is the training they wanted. So I went straight from my BA, uh, without any postgrad work, to becoming a lecturer, a tenured lecturer, <laughs> because they wanted someone to do this very important work. So there I was in Australia, organising films and music and theatre and travels and festivals and things like that. And then I got to the stage where I found people were misunderstanding what was going on. They didn't understand what art was. They were making some big mistakes, particularly nationalism in art, which is a terrible thing. Kiwi art, Aussie art, which is shocking art, isn't like that. It may have been when there's no communication, but they're getting awards and you get prize if you're a key Kiwi or an Aussie or a woman or something like that, which is absurd. So um, I went to study a PhD in aesthetics. This is very strange territory. It's not very really often done. Uh, not to PhD level, anyway. Not in aesthetics, especially social art. It's almost unknown. And I was also, uh, my own background is social religion. So I was doing sociology, specialising in religion and art. And it's a very strange area. So when the 60s hit, and it all went and hit the fan, and there was trouble where I began to combine my experiences into a combination movement. A special student movement. A special, very, very special student movement. <laughs> very strange one, called ALF. <laughs> ALF. Now, I've, I've heard of the ALF party before, and I didn't think, mm. I sort of had some ideas Alf's of what titles could be. Yes, yes. yes. Mm. Action for love and freedom. Mm. Sounds like a fabulous idea to me. Well, most people want one or the other. The hippies wanted love, not freedom, and the, and the re revolution wanted freedom, but not love. So it was sort of, they were going to extremes, and the two forces are hard to balance. Because love means you lose your freedom to become part of a group and you have to give up some of your personal freedoms and you have to stick to certain rules. Not necessarily. I think it does. Without, think? If there's no restriction on love, it isn't love at all. It's just casual. Mm. It's got to be a strict discipline for love to work. Mother, child, man, woman, you know, just master and, and servants. So and all these require strict structures for it to be, to be efficient. And freedom is all about, you know, who cares a damn about anybody? Children abandon their parents, you know, people are just promiscuous, don't care about their bosses, and don't stay in a job very long. This sort of is also very common, this sort of inable, inability to be responsible to anybody or take the blame or to love anyone very long. So the combination was very hard to engineer, but it meant a kind of reform without violence, and no one wanted that, because those who wanted reform wanted violence, and those who didn't want reform uh, didn't, didn't like anything we were doing, so it was tricky. Now, this is 1968 mm, in Australia. Yeah, and the big riots were there. And I could the stop violence stop. We, we were, did things that were funny and amusing because I also added the touch to it, which I called the fun revolution, which is my own special ingredient. Because if you make it, I love you stuff, you get very cramped up. Ugh. But if you don't say anything about it and you show you do and you keep laughing and joking, they'll cooperate more. And we got reforms on the campus. They went, the tutorials brightened up the students were much happier. And everything went well. 
But then the Marxists got furious because they wanted a revolution. They wanted to, to destabilize the campus. With no fun involved whatsoever. Well, fun would destroy any socialist. They can't. They're not fun being a socialist or a fascist or any of those people. They're not into the fun stuff. That's more C of E fun and country folk and things like this. So they had to stop it. And the, and the story of my persecution and eventual and my eventual destruction is in the book. Mm -hmm. And my rebounding as a wizard to their surprise, as even from the vice chancellor's appointment, that was a bit of a shock to them. So they couldn't cope with wizards. That's the last straw for them. But I got cut off, my supplies all dried up. Anyone that knew me was punished, and there was no one left to support me at all. By 1972, 73, there was not one person would dare even sit near me in the cab, except Lloyd Alice, of course, and a couple of my trainee wizards. So I came to New Zealand. Mm, came to New Zealand. Came to New Zealand. She says, mm. madly flicking through, and discovered. Mm. Christchurch in 1974 was a sleepy, extremely conservative English-style cathedral town in the South Island. The citizens could be roused to political action only by infringements in the parks or plans for demolishing old and respected buildings. Church fates, rugby football, garden shows, choral singing, and the A word, Anglicanism. Well, of course. I'm very, 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 very surprised to discover that the wizard has distinct Anglican leanings. Well, I can't help it. It's brought up an Anglican. Once an Anglican, always an Anglican. For example, an Anglican atheist is not like a Jewish atheist or a, or a Roman Catholic atheist. Roman Catholic atheists always become communist, don't they? Whereas Anglican atheists become rather uh, decadent, I'm afraid. So was it these qualities that made you think that Christchurch would be accepting of a wizard? Yes, because the English tradition is of irony and tongue-in-the-cheek, and they like humour, whereas other cult traditions, like Auckland, wouldn't enjoy it at all. In fact, I hardly ever go to Auckland. They don't like me up there very much. So they don't appreciate my humour very well. But they do here, Christchurch. <laughs> yes. Well, some of them do. Not all. Oh, there's a few killjoys. And they're, they're, the trouble is they've got political power, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. That was another thing that surprised me. I always thought you'd had a lot of support from the council, that you were a, a, a cultural asset, and that they would have been encouraging Well, that. the tourists came pouring in to see me, because I was in all the guidebooks. Mm. All over the world, one in 75, a long time ago. But no tourist group would encourage me. And the city council didn't want to know I existed. In fact, they were, they were really uh, hostile in the very beginning, and have been until quite recently. So I've had no backing of anybody. I've gone on in spite of all this, and I did it without being paid at my own expense mm -hmm. for 25 years. But there's signs of change now, I'm glad to say. Looking Excellent. Better. Excellent. Very pleased to hear it. Now, let's talk about not being a name or number. Is that some, obviously, that's something that's really important to you. Well, if you're a spiritual person, you don't want to have any tax number, welfare number, property, or contracts. And that's the first thing that a person's spirituality should know. The closest thing to it are the gurus who wander in the fakirs in India and the nuns like that who do restrict their lives. They don't go shopping at all. They don't want families. They've got more important things to do. And I've always been like that. I couldn't help it. I'm not really spiritual. But I don't like material things. They, they bore me. I get tired of them. And therefore, it was nice to find someone who would, ex who would share my viewpoints. And I do find them particularly amongst males, and occasionally females. It's very hard. Women just love shopping too. Absolutely, much, shopping. absolutely. They're materialistic <laughs> creatures, they really are. However, if they don't mind me not being like them, if they don't mind if I don't work and pay the bills and, and do my stuff, then I can get on with women like that. And I have, of course, to vote to, to Alice, lovely Alice, who's absolutely. been battling for 25 years to marry me, still hasn't got there. But she's, <laughs> she's been a good supporter. Mm. And you'll see she appears in the book and so on the romance side. But I am a spiritual person, but not it, openly, not in theory, only in practice. Mm. Excellent. Theory but not practice. Our wizard. Actually, I don't know if I agree with that. I'd say practice as well as theory. No, but anyway, the, anyway. My life is a miracle. Buy it, read it. Very insightful. As the wizard was just saying, wonderful romantic story, a love story as well as a travel guide, as well as an insight into one of our cultural icons. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. See you tomorrow night.